Well, thank you, uh, Chairman Thornberry, Ranking Member Smith, and distinguished members of the committee. I'm here at your invitation to testify on two subjects, the 2018 National Defense Strategy and the Nuclear Posture Review, and I'm joined by the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief, General Selva. Even in the midst of our ongoing counterterrorism campaigns, my role is to keep the peace for one more year, one more month, one more day, giving Secretary Tillerson and our diplomats time to resolve cr crises through diplomatic channels. The Department of Defense does this by providing the Commander-in-Chief with military options that ensure our diplomats negotiate from a position of strength. Up front, I need to note three days from now I will visit our nation's first Security Force Assistance Brigade in Fort Benning, Georgia, as they prepare to deploy to Afghanistan. To advance the security of our nation, these troops are putting themselves in harm's way, in effect signing a blank check payable to the American people with their lives. They do so despite Congress's abrogation of its constitutional responsibility to provide sufficient stable funding. Our military has been operating under debilitating continuing resolutions for more than 1,000 days during the past decade. These men and women hold the line for America while lacking this most fundamental congressional support, a predictable budget. Congress mandated, rightfully mandated, this national defense strategy, the first one in a decade, and then shut down the government the day of its release. Today, we are again operating under a disruptive continuing resolution. It is not lost on me that as I testify before you this morning, we are again on the verge of a government shutdown or at best, another damaging continuing resolution. I regret that without sustained predictable appropriations, my presence here today wastes your time because no strategy can survive, as you pointed out, Chairman, without the funding necessary to resource it. Yet we all know that America can afford survival. Nations as different as China and Russia have chosen to be strategic competitors. They seek to create a world consistent with their authoritarian models and pursue veto power over other nations' economic, diplomatic, and security decisions. Rogue regimes like North Korea and Iran persist in taking outlaw actions that undermine and threaten regional and global stability. And despite our successes to date against ISIS physical caliphate, violent extremist organizations continue to sow hatred, incite violence, and murder innocents. Across the globe, democracies are taking notice. We recognize great power competition is once again a reality. We will continue to prosecute the campaign against terrorism by, with, and through our allies. But in our new defense strategy, great power competition not terrorism, is now the primary focus of U.S. national security. Our military remains capable, but our competitive edge has eroded in every domain of warfare, air, land, sea, cyber, and space. Under frequent continuing resolutions and sequester's budget caps, our advantages continue to shrink. The combination of rapidly changing technology the negative impact on military readiness resulting from the longest continuous stretch of combat in our nation's history and insufficient funding have created an overstretched and under-resourced military. During last week's State of the Union address, President Trump said weakness is the surest path to conflict. To those who might suggest that we should accept a year-long continuing resolution, it would mean a return to a disastrous sequestration level of funding for the military. And in a world of wash and change and increasing threats, there is no room for complacency. History makes clear that no country has a preordained right to victory on the battlefield. Framed within President Trump's national security strategy and aligned with the Department of State, our 2018 national defense strategy provides clear strategic direction for America's military. A long-term strategic competition requires the seamless integration of multiple elements of national power, diplomacy, information, economics, finance, intelligence, law enforcement, and military. The department's principal priorities are long-term strategic competitions with China and Russia. 
Given the magnitude of the threats they pose to U.S. security and prosperity today, Congress must commit to both an increased and sustained investment in our capabilities. Concurrently, the Department will sustain its efforts to deter and counter road regimes such as North Korea and Iran, defeat terrorist threats to the United States, and consolidate our gains in Iraq and Afghanistan while moving to a more resource-sustainable approach. More than any other nation, America can expand the competitive space. We can challenge our competitors where we possess advantages and they lack strength. To restore a competitive military edge, this defense strategy pursues three primary lines of effort. To build a more lethal force, to strengthen traditional alliances while building new partnerships, and reform the department's business practices for performance and affordability. Our first line of effort emphasizes that everything we do must contribute to the lethality of our military. In war, an enemy will attack a perceived weakness. Therefore, we cannot adopt a single preclusive form of warfare. Rather, we must be able to fight across the spectrum of combat. This means the size and composition of our force matters. The nation must field a sufficient, capable force to deter conflict. If deterrence fails, we must win. To defend our way of life, our military will embrace change while holding fast to traditional proven attributes that make us the most formidable force on any battlefield. Those who would threaten America's experiment in democracy must know if you threaten us, it will be your longest and worst day. To implement this strategy, we will invest in key capabilities, recognizing we cannot expect success fighting tomorrow's conflicts with yesterday's weapons and equipment. Driven by this strategy, next week you will see in our FY19 budget investments the following, space and cyber, nuclear deterrent forces, missile defense, advanced autonomous systems, artificial intelligence, and professional military education to provide our high-quality troops what they need to win. We will prioritize rebuilding readiness while modernizing our existing force. We will also be changing our force's posture to prioritize readiness for war fighting and major combat, making us strategically predictable for our allies and operationally unpredictable for any adversary. Our second line of effort is to strengthen traditional alliances while building new partnerships. History is clear that nations with allies thrive. We inherited this approach to security and prosperity from the greatest generation, and it has served the United States well for 70 years. Working by, with, and through allies who carry their fair share is a source of strength. Since the costly victory in World War II, Americans have carried a disproportionate share of the global defense burden while others recovered. Today, the growing economic strength of allies and partners has enabled them to step up. As demonstrated by more than 70 nations and international organizations participating in the Defeat ISIS campaign, and again in the 40-some nations standing shoulder to shoulder in NATO's resolute support mission in Afghanistan. Most NATO allies are also increasing their defense budgets, giving credence to the value of democracies standing together. Our third line of effort serves as the foundation for our military's competitive edge, reforming the business practices of the department to provide both solvency and security, and thereby gaining full benefit from every dollar spent. Every day, we will earn the trust of Congress and the American people. We must be good stewards of the tax dollars entrusted to us. In this regard, we will deliver our department's full financial audit this year because results and accountability matter. The first audit in DOD's history will reveal how we can be better stewards. The department is transitioning to a culture of performance and affordability that operates at the speed of relevance. We will prioritize speed of delivery continuous adaptation, and frequent modular upgrades. With your critical support, we will shed outdated management and acquisition processes while adopting American industry's best practices. If current structures inhibit 
our pursuit of lethality, I expect my service secretaries and defense agency heads to consolidate, eliminate, and restructure to achieve the mission. One of the key elements of the 2018 National Defense Strategy is to ensure America's military provides a safe, secure, and effective nuclear deterrent. Last January, President Trump directed a nuclear posture review to ensure the United States nuclear deterrent is modern, robust, flexible, resilient, ready, and appropriately tailored to deter 21st century threats and reassure allies. I recently received a letter from senators concerned that the 2018 nuclear posture review would undermine decades of U.S. leadership on efforts to reduce and eventually eliminate the ex existential threat posed by nuclear weapons. To the contrary, the 2018 Nuclear Posture Review reaffirms the mutually reinforcing role of nuclear deterrence in a complex and dynamic security environment while underscoring continued U.S. commitment to nonproliferation, to counter nuclear terrorism, and to arms control. Specifically, the review reflects the Department of Defense's strategic priority to maintain a safe and effective nuclear deterrent that will successfully deter nuclear and non-nuclear strategic attacks, assure our allies and partners, respond effectively should deterrence fail, and hedge against future uncertainties and dangers. The United States remains committed to its global leadership role to reduce the number of nuclear weapons and to fulfill existing treaty and arms control obligations, leadership that has reduced our nuclear weapons stockpile by over 85 percent from its Cold War high. Yet we must recognize that deterrence and arms control can only be achieved with a credible capability. A review of the global nuclear situation is sobering. While Russia has reduced only the number of its accountable strategic nuclear force as agreed upon in the New START Treaty, at the same time Russia has been modernizing these weapons as well as other nuclear systems. Moscow advocates a theory of nuclear escalation for military conflict. China too is modernizing and expanding its already considerable nuclear forces, pursuing entirely new nuclear capabilities. It is also modernizing its conventional military to challenge U.S. military superiority. Despite universal condemnation in the United Nations, North Korea's nuclear provocations threaten regional and global peace, and Iran's nuclear ambitions remain an unresolved concern. Globally, nuclear terrorism remains a tangible threat. As Senator McCain said last week, since the end of the Cold War, we have let our nuclear capabilities atrophy under the false belief that the era of great power competition was over. As the new National Defense Strategy rightfully acknowledges, we now face the renewed threat of competition from Russia and China, and we cannot ignore their investments in nuclear weapons in addition to conventional forces. The 2018 Nuclear Posture Review reaffirms the findings of previous reviews that the nuclear triad, comprised of silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles, bomber aircraft, and nuclear submarines, is the most strategically sound means of ensuring nuclear deterrence. To remain effective, however, we must recapitalize our Cold War legacy nuclear deterrence forces, continuing a modernization program initiated during the previous administration. To quote my predecessor, Secretary Carter, quote, we have been in a nuclear arms race for two decades now, but the U.S. hasn't been running the race, unquote. And as you can see demonstrated in this chart over here in the corner of the room, that, it, uh, that gives credence to my predecessor's observation, the nuclear delivery system development over the last eight years shows numerous advances by Russia, by China, and by North Korea versus the near absence of such activity by the United States, with competitors and adversaries developing 34 new systems in that time as compared to only one for the U.S., the F-35 aircraft. 
nuclear deterrence will continue to play a critical role in preventing nuclear attack and large-scale conventional warfare between nuclear-armed states for the foreseeable future. U.S. nuclear weapons assure and defend our allies against conventional and nuclear threats, furthering our non-proliferation goals and increasing global security. The National Defense Strategy and the Nuclear Posture Review align with the President's National Security Strategy, guiding all of our efforts. As I said earlier, no strategy can survive without the necessary stable, predictable funding. Failure to modernize our military risks leaving us with a force that could dominate the last war, but be irrelevant to tomorrow's security. We need Congress to lift the defense spending caps and support the budget for our military of $700 billion for this fiscal year and $716 billion for next fiscal year. Let me be clear, as hard as the last 16 years of war have been on our military, no enemy in the field has done as much to harm the readiness of the U.S. military than the combined impact of the Budget Control Act's defense spending caps, worsened by operating for 10 of the last 11 years under continuing resolutions of varied and unpredictable duration. The Budget Control Act was purposely designed to be so injurious that it would force Congress to pass necessary budgets. It was never intended to be the solution. For too long, we have asked our military to carry on stoically with a success-at-any-cost attitude. Our troops work tirelessly to accomplish every mission with increasingly inadequate and misaligned resources simply because Congress has not maintained regular order. The fact that our volunteer military has performed so well is a credit to their dedication and professionalism. We expect the men and women of our military to be faithful in their service, even when going in harm's way. We must also remain faithful to them. Chairman, as you said in January, if Congress does not come together to find a way to fund this strategy, Secretary Mattis must explicitly inform Congress and the American people of the consequences of failure. The consequences of not providing a budget are clear. Even though we are protecting ongoing operations from continuing resolution disruptions, each increment of funding in support of our partners in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria requires a 15-day congressional notification. My commanders in the field write to me for help in getting timely and predictable funds for their efforts as they work to execute our strategy against the enemy in the field. Additionally, should we stumble into a year-long continuing resolution, your military will not be able to provide pay for our troops by the end of the fiscal year. We will not recruit the 15,000 Army soldiers and 4,000 Air Force airmen required to fill critical manning shortfalls. We will not maintain our ships at sea with the proper balance between operations and time in port for maintenance. We will ground aircraft due to a lack of maintenance and spare parts, we will deplete the ammunition, training, and manpower required to deter war and delay contracts for vital acquisition programs necessary to modernize the force. Further, I cannot overstate the impact to our troops' morale from all this uncertainty. Today, as I sit here, we are engaged in prudent planning in the Pentagon for another disruptive government shutdown. You know that I cannot care more about our country's defense than this Congress, for it is Congress alone which has the constitutional authority to raise and support armies and to provide and maintain a Navy. We need Congress back in the driver's seat, not in the spectator's seat of the Budget Control Act's indiscriminate and automatic cuts. I know that in time of a major war, Congress will provide our military with all it needs. But money at the time of crisis fails to deter war. And you know we would be at that point to have nothing, no time to prepare as it takes months and years to produce the munitions, the training, and readiness required to fight well. To carry out the strategy you rightly directed we develop, we need you to pass a budget now. If we are to sustain our military's primacy, we need budget predictability. Congress must take action now to ensure our military's lethality is sufficient to defend our way of life, to preserve the promise of prosperity, and to pass on the freedoms we enjoy to the next generation. And I ask that you not let disagreements on domestic policy 
continue to hold our nation's defense hostage. General Selva will now discuss the military dimensions of the 2018 National Defense Strategy and our nuclear posture review. Thank you.